I'll read the scripture, Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. It says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Say, this is me. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, say the whole building, we are the building. The whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also, you also, say me, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. See, church, this is the primary purpose of the church. The primary purpose of the church is not a program or an organization or a membership class or a discipleship class or a kid's church or a worship set. The primary purpose of the church is to be a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. He is building us. He is building his people, the church. We are the church. The people of God gathered together in one place is a building, is a dwelling place for God in the spirit. That is what he's doing in us. And so we want to talk this morning about what that looks like as a community. What does it look like for us to follow the wind of the spirit, to allow ourselves to be built together in Christ as a dwelling place for God and how that changes us as a community, impacts our community and the world for Jesus. Amen. Say amen. amen. All right. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are building us, this house, Encounter Church, your people as we gather. You are building us to be a dwelling place. We are a dwelling place for you by your spirit in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your word this morning. May it reach every heart in this place. And may not one person leave without experiencing your tangible manifest presence in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. Well, um, you, guys get, you guys ready? So we're going to hear from them. Um, I want to talk first. What does it mean? What does it mean to be a people of the presence of the Lord? He just whispered to me that I'm going first, so. <laughs> um, what does it mean to be people of the presence? I think, I mean, it, I think it starts with knowing him, right? When you know someone, you know what their voice sounds like. Mm. Like when, when, we're, when we're in moments of worship or when I'm going about my week, if I know what my father sounds like, it's easy to recognize his voice. So I think it starts there. It starts with our union with him and how important it is to, um, to stay in like constant communion with the Lord. So good. Because when I'm constantly in communion with him, there's no like, oh, well, God, wait, what are you saying? Wait, I don't know. Wait, what? No, I'm confident that it's his voice because I know him. Yeah. Because I'm spending time with him. It's good. Because I hear him speak to me in the secret so I can hear him speak to me when others are around. Yeah. Yeah. And so it starts there at the secret place. I mean, people, like, I got asked this question one time, like, oh, how do you, um, how do you not get burnt out in the church? And I was like, you be filled to overflow. If we're not spending time with the Lord in our secret place, if we're not spending time with him in the moments where nobody sees us, where no one is around. And so I think it starts there. It starts with our union with him. Because if I know him, just like in a relationship, the more I spend time with him, the more I know him. And it's easy for me to hear his voice and follow where he wants to go, to just follow his lead. So yeah, so good. I think it starts there. Love it. It's brilliant, brilliant. First thing I think of is new covenant realities mm -hmm. that we, and it, it really goes in line with what Sarah was just saying, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so, and we're one with him. He who joins himself to the Lord, Paul says, is one spirit with him. And I think to be people of the presence, we have to get rid of the language uh, and lies of separation That's and distance. Yeah. So... There is a reality that in him, 
Colossians 1, in Jesus, all things have their being, or in him, thing, all things consist. In him, all things are held together, mm. is what the original language says. So that's a spiritual reality that God is everywhere, holding all things together. Yeah. Yes. And then there's the other reality, which is that his manifest presence, his glory, mm. that is so brilliant and and uh, amazing that we can't even comprehend it or look into it um and so you have and there's a degree in between all of those you know like so i think there is a reality that he's with us in force but then this is what it means to be people of presence that mystically there's this beautiful corporate encounter that we can have with him mm. and it should be our heart's hunger God wants to meet with his people. This is a mystical reality all throughout the Bible from the garden with Adam and Eve to the tabernacle to the temple that was all a type and a shadow of Jesus himself tabernacling among us and, and his spirit now within us. But when we come together, there's this beautiful mystical uh, encounter that we get to experience his presence together like this morning. Amen. Mm. And I think being a people of presence is being a people that are sensitive to the moving of yeah. his heart, yeah. uh, of his voice, of his word. So I love the questions that you sent us, and we can dive more into um, to that aspect of it, because I think sometimes we have this false dichotomy between a spirit church and a word church, and I think it's important to distinguish. Sure. Uh, they complement, they agree, they complement one another. Yeah. And so to be a person of the presence means you feast on the word. Yeah. Yes. Like the scripture is holy. The scripture is life. His words are life. And when you're a, somebody who's yielded to the heart of God, it's easy to read the scripture and glean and feast. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all of the above. I also think being somebody that is, or a people, a community that are presence driven is that our hearts are, we're, we are a people that, uh, I don't want to say strive, but we're always endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Yeah. Like we won't allow anything to separate us from our love for one another. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. We talk about like nothing can separate us from the love of God. Then we let the stupidest things separate us from each other's mm -hmm. love. Amen. And when we're people of presence, we ain't got no time for that. Come on, somebody. Like we don't have time. Like it's not, it's never worth staying bitter. It's never worth Sometimes I feel like some people confess Jesus as Lord, but they allow their hearts to be, uh, bitterness to be preeminent over their hearts. That means that bitterness is Lord, not Jesus. Wow. Unforgiveness can be Lord when we think Jesus is Lord. We profess wow. Jesus as Lord, but we allow offense, bitterness, ought, uh, th things to divide us, and we're not under the Lordship of heaven. Wow. And being a people of the presence says, this is important, mm. just like this is important this relationship that we have. And that's where the presence of God intensifies is when our hearts are in harmony, yes. when there's a so connection good. and that, that unity of the spirit. Wow. So, that's, amen. That's awesome. Isn't that beautiful? That hit me when you said like, what's like, I can confess Jesus as Lord, but if I live in a place of offense, then offense is actually my Lord. Like It's dominating wow. over our thoughts yeah. and that's our good. heart. I mean, and I'm preaching to myself. Mm. The, the Lord showed me this a few times like, hey, you're not allowing me to have dominion over your heart right now because all you're thinking about is all of these things. Yeah, yeah. wow. And that could go with many different things that we allow to dominate, but. That's beautiful. Um, so awesome. Like there's so many things that could be Lord of our life and we say that Jesus is Lord. If he's actually Lord, <laughs> then the fruit of the spirit follows. Yeah. Let me add this, that yeah. being a people of presence is not, it doesn't mean we have our eyes glazed over and we're so mystical that we're not grounded in the reality of this planet. Hello? Being in the spirit doesn't mean you're detached all the time from responsibility. Yeah. It actually is the opposite. Yeah. I can be in the spirit and be playing with my kids Amen. and loving my wife. Listen, if I'm in the spirit, then I'm going to love my wife and take her on dates. Come on, husbands got quiet in this Presbyterian church, whatever. Y'all need a marriage conference or something. The Corsos are going to have that again. You need to sign up. Wait till the fall. I think it's important though that we understand that like there is this reality when the, we're people of the presence that we're actually grounded. Yeah. And we're not, it's not like, oh, we're people of the presence. We're not tossed around. Right. No, right. we're rooted in him. 
we know him. We know his word. There's mm-hmm. wisdom. There's faith. There's, we're anchored in God. Yeah, yeah. And it's not this. I, I just feel like sometimes people, they experience, a, taste a little bit of the charismatic movement. And maybe we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there are things that are kind of wild about the charismatic movement. But we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should see the beauty of what heaven is doing. But there is this misunderstanding that to be charismatic or people of the presence that we have to be weird. We don't have to be weird. Yeah. Being weird doesn't Preach. make us more holy or more spiritual. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and so I think that's an important yeah. reality is that we're, it's, it's like, no, we're people of the presence. We don't have our eyes glazed over and we're just glazed over and we don't know what's going on in the world. No, we're actually, it's the opposite. Yeah. We're focused. Yeah. We're hearing from heaven and heaven is invading earth and we're on an assignment. Come on. Yeah. People of presence know their assignment yeah. and carry it out. So good. It does lead to the next question I had. I said, um, my question was, how do we learn how to follow the wind of the Spirit, how to follow what the Lord is doing, and not just in worship, but when we are um, receiving the Word, when we're in a Bible study, when we're, like you said, uh, loving our family, when we're out winning the loss, when we're a part of our community. Because like you said, like, I think we talk about following the spirit and we think that's only what happens in worship when we're singing and raising our hands, but following the wind of the spirit. And I was talking to Chris and hopefully we have an opportunity to have you share that where she was following the wind of the spirit that led to encounters with people three times this week where they experienced the love of God in just a very simple way. And so um, how do we do that as the people of God, as we're learning to be people of his presence, a community that is a dwelling, a dwelling place for God and the spirit, how do we learn how to follow the wind in all these areas of our lives? That's a tough question. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's where it started, was, was when I started leading worship. Because um, there's... For me, like there's so much going on in my brain, but having to follow the Lord, but lead the people, sing to the Lord, wanting to, you know, still lead from a pure place and really be genuinely worshiping. So I think that's kind of where it started for me was learning how to like ebb and flow with the Holy Spirit, just kind of learning this like back and forth balance. And then that overflows into the rest of your life. So I think that's, I think that's where it starts is in a place of union and worship with God. Um, and then we learn how to worship while we feast on the scriptures. Yeah. And then we learn how to worship when we're giving, when we're being generous, yeah. like v- regular life things. Hey, my friend's kind of in a tough spot. I think I want to bless them. That's worship. Yeah. That's people of his presence. Yeah. Learning to hear his voice in every situation. It's, so it starts in this place of union. It starts learning the ebb and flow with the Holy Spirit, learning that that communion with him. And I keep saying all of these words, like I'm, I'm repeating them, but for a reason, they're important. Like to communion with him. I remember the first time I learned what perichoresis was. My dad was telling me, he's like, oh, perichoresis. Okay, it's, it's the divine dance within the Trinity. And learning that we are in the, in the middle of that. We're invited into this divine dance with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So placing... Be, becoming fully aware that we are in that space. Mm. We're in that space with the Lord. He's invited us to come and dwell with him. So we're in this divine dance with God. So just learning how to ground yourself in that. And again, I loved what you said about, like, we're not people that are, like, eyes glazed over. We're not, and we're not people that are just like, oh, we're so passive and we're so, you know, just the Lord and we're so soft and quiet. No, there's a, there's a fierceness to his presence. There's a mighty wind to his presence. It's not always something soft. It can be. The Lord is kind. But so, so just, just learning him. Like he, he's, he's kind, but he's mighty. He's wild. That's why sometimes we have moments in worship where we're face down and silent. Or we have moments of worship where I'm jumping around and screaming and shouting. Because the Lord is mighty and there is a shout within us that he wants to release. And I think that that applies to every area of our lives. You know, somebody is somebody in my life that I, that the Lord wants me to speak to. It's not going to be a soft spoken thing. There's a fierceness. Mm. 
So I think just, just learning, being, being so confident and aware of where we are in God, yes. wrapped up in this divine dance between the Trinity, constantly surrounded by him, learning to hear his voice. And I think it starts with worship and then it overflows to every area. So Beautiful. The first thing I think of is that we have to learn to recognize when we're not hearing God. Mm, that's good. Like we have to be humble enough to admit, like I missed it. Yeah. There is this weird thing that we do sometimes where we use God told me as a form to manipulate mm. and we've got to get away from it because it's not much different than witchcraft. You can't, if you can't question someone's God told me, then they've become their own God voice. And sometimes we're, we're, we're this, this way in, in our spirit ledness. Well, the Lord told me. It's like, well, okay, you might have. Does it align with the word? Come on. Does it exalt Jesus as Lord? And does it bear lasting fruit? Those are three ways to tell a manifestation. If you think you're hearing from God, does it align with the scripture? Does it align with new covenant realities? The heart of God, what is the person of Jesus, and and then we look through of the some of the things in the New Testament that that like uh, some of the apostolic witness to the things that are in the old, you know. So we look at we look at that and we're like, okay, does it align with that? So questioning the God told me thing, I've looked back in my life and thought, well, I thought I heard from the Lord, but I realized it didn't bear a lot of fruit, or it wasn't lasting fruit, and I'm like, you know what, I missed it. I didn't hear. And that's how we recognize the voice of the shepherd. And I think it's important that we dive into the scripture and make it a pattern that we're, we're feasting on the word. We're devoted. It's like a rhythm, like waves. Every morning, just let your heart just crash into the word. And, and then obviously in that place of feasting on the word, you're aware of his presence. And you're aware of his presence wherever you go, like what you were saying, you know. And um, I think it's very important, though, that we, we realize that sometimes we don't hear right and we have to admit it, yeah. you know. I've learned not to be afraid to question people's the Lord told me. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I ever do that, don't get offended. I've told people flat out, I don't think the Lord told you that. Wow. You, you can actually not agree. That's okay. We can, right. we can not agree. But I'm just going to tell you flat out, I don't think the Lord told you that. Um, and so I want someone to be able to, you should be able to question me like that. Like I have people in my life, you have people in your life that you see eye to eye with, right? People that are that lead and, and the multitude of counselors are safety. How many know that there are a lot of strange, crazy things that can happen with somebody's God told me? I mean, that's how culture formed, right? Well, God told me, and then we'll even take a few verses and string them together. We're like, look, it's in the Bible. It's like, that's old McDonald theology. Here, verse, there, verse, everywhere, verse, verse. You can make the Bible say whatever you want to say. You can literally make the Bible say, you can make it stand up and talk like a dog. Like, that, that's not the use of the scripture. That's not how we're supposed to. So that's important. The other thing I'll just mention briefly is that worship is a participation in the life of Jesus through the Spirit. In other words, that when we worship, it's not just when I'm lifting my hands and I'm singing. We worship and our lives are participating in Christ through the Spirit. Worship is like a river we step into and it affects every area of our life. In other words, we become this fountain of worship that we're glorifying God. We're magnifying God in everything that we do, not just a Sunday morning song when we're singing some beautiful song about pure worship, but our worship becomes pure because we're, so it's it's not like this self-effort thing. We love him because he first loved us. My worship is springing forth from a place. My praise is I'm giving back the breath he's given me in praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So worship is that. Worship is when last night we had a little date night. And that is glorifying to the Lord because my wife is my first ministry. And so I'm worshiping and glorifying God by pouring out my love and affection on my bride. Because it looks just like Jesus. But me doing that, it's not because I'm such a cool spiritual pastor It's because I participate in the life of Jesus because of what he's done and the spirit empowers all of that. Worship is a participation before it's a practice. 
just like holiness. So I think we got to step back and think worship is so much bigger than a few songs. Worship is participation in Jesus by the Holy Spirit when we glorify God in everything that we do. I love that. Giving to the poor. Yeah. Loving the poor. Exactly. Because I feel like where we're headed as a church, and that leads to my next question, but where we're headed as a church, we, we, everybody in this room, we have to understand that we are participating in the harvest that God is bringing to himself. Like, there is a harvest that there are orphans and there are children that don't know that they've been adopted. There's a whole community of people that don't know that they have been adopted and included into what God has done, into what Jesus did on the cross. And as they come into our churches, as they come into our lives, as we meet them on the street, if we understand that we participate in in what God is doing, we are are participating in the, the union of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Worship is greeting at a door. Worship is standing in a parking lot. Worship is putting words on a screen. Worship is, is loving on our babies. Worship is cleaning a toilet. Worship is giving. Worship is serving. Worship is loving. And so I think sometimes, and I, you, you touched on this, as a charismatic churches, we emphasize the work of the Spirit as what God does on a Sunday morning in a service. And we deprioritize all the other things that he's doing in somebody's life. We don't understand that the work of the Spirit is also when somebody hugs somebody at the door that hasn't felt the love of God in a long time. When a smile just makes someone's day. When we don't understand what's happening, when you just serve somebody a cup of coffee and be like, hey, how was your day? The work of the Spirit goes beyond just what he's doing. Now, I'm not diminishing the work that God does on a Sunday morning because there's somebody that comes into the room and they experience the manifest presence of God. And an encounter, one encounter with God can change a life forever. But it's beyond that. It's it's to every single person. It goes beyond every um, thing that we can imagine. It's not just... Worship's not just a song. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship's everything that we do. And so as the people of God, I want us to be able to participate in the harvest that he's bringing to our community. And so that means me saying, I'm going to give of myself, give of my life. And it's not not just about what I'm going to receive in a service, but what I can give to the community of people, the dwelling place of God and the spirit that he's bringing. So I want to touch on that a little bit more. Um, I love... There's a spiritual, like, revelation in that that we have to capture, Mm -hmm. and it it can grow. Jesus said in Matthew 25, when you've done them to the least of these, you've done them unto me. Visiting those that are in prison, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry. There's something about, the like, even in Colossians, Paul says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. We were talking about this yesterday with somebody or a couple days ago. The sister in the Lord was talking about when, what does it mean to be a greeter? What does it mean to be an usher? Like when you greet someone at the door, greet them as if you're greeting Jesus. Come on. How would you accept and receive and welcome the Lord if he walked through the door? Yeah. And there's this beautiful thing that happens when uh, he said, if you've done them unto the least of these, you've done them unto me. And, and I love that heart, that po- heart posture where there is this, this sensitivity. Yeah. This, it's like sometimes it's a mighty wind, sometimes it's a gentle breeze. Yeah. But the point is, is that our heart is following after the heartbeat of God. And if our heart is following after the heartbeat of God, we're quick to do these things. Like, I'm not just going to prophesy, I'm actually going to paint the wall because the wall needs some paint. Yeah. <laughs> and every role that I do, come on, Tom, where's Tom at? Come on, somebody, he owns a painting company. Every role of paint that I do... I am glorifying Jesus Come on. and I'm worshiping him. Mm. No matter what, whatever you do, do it with your whole heart, Colossians says, as unto the Lord. And that, you know, that helps us yeah. have an awareness of his presence. Yeah. 
to where we are constantly, I'm serving the Lord. Yep. What, God, what do you have for me today? You're at work. You're punching in. I'm doing this unto the Lord. Yeah. And then you do it with a spirit of honor and gratefulness. And, and that's how promotions take place. Yeah. I mean, it, you just, with humility and love, and you're doing it unto the Lord. It's powerful. So awesome. So, awesome. so last question, and we'll wrap it up with this. As a church, what do you see that God is doing in and through us as this community encounter church in this next season? Um, I want to start by just saying that the last four years that I've lived in Rochester have been some of the toughest of my life, but the community that is this church and this body is like, you guys blow my mind, honestly. I, I think that I, there's, there's just something so special. I just, I wanna highlight, there's something so special about us, about these people, about all of you. And there's, so, there's something so special about like our hearts and the way that we're joined together, just the communion that we have with one another. Um, and every time I think that we come together and we do like, you know, community events, all of, all of this stuff, I just, I think that this, you people, every single one of you, you're all so, 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 so special. And God has placed you here for reason and for purpose. Like yeah. there is not one of you in this room that God doesn't want you here. Yeah. There's not one of you. I, I, I think that as we, as we move into a new space, as we're moving into something that feels a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more challenging for some of us, I think it's important to recognize where God has placed us. Yeah. Come on. And I think there's such value in every single person that's in this room. Every time we get together, you know, for whatever it is, I'm, I'm literally blown away by every single one of you. I think that you people are the most special people I've ever met in my entire life. And I mean that genuinely. <laughs> And so I think as we move into this space, I'm just, I'm so grateful for all of you. Yeah. I'm so grateful so for this good. people, so for good. this, this assembly that God has, has put together. And as we move, I think God is, is, um, he's increasing, he's increasing his manifest presence, but I think he's also joining our hearts together in a way like never before, Come on. like never before. Because when we're in the presence of God together, our hearts are yielded and we, yeah. we grow closer. That's, especially that's evident, especially going through tough times. I think a lot of us in this room have seen and recognized what God has done the last few years, but at the same time, the valleys that we've kind of been through, mm -hmm. the tough stuff. And I just, I see, I see God taking us into a place where we are, I can't, I don't even, I, I don't even have words to, to describe it. Like when we're all unified, when we're all joined together, lifting and exalting the name of Jesus, I just, I know it, we experience an increase of his presence every single week. Every single week we experience an increase and an increase and an increase. And I think that God is just taking us even deeper into his presence. I can't wait to see what the rest of, what, like what God does. I think that this will be a safe haven for the broken. I think this place will be um, a, a place for the hurting, for people who are lost. I think that God is drawing those people in and especially because of how special each and every one of you are. Because we are the hands and we're the feet. We're called to love the broken. So, yeah, anyway, that's, I just love you guys so, so much. And this, 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 this community of people, this body is so special. I think about it all the time. Like, I don't think that God could have called me anywhere else, you know. I don't think that I would have gone anywhere else. I mean, I would have gone because his voice, I'll go wherever he says. But I think he was really, really, really specific about where he wanted us and about every single one of you. So I thank God for you. I thank God for you every day. So good. Just to resound Sarah's words, every single one of you is significant. 
And I think discovering our significance in him and then being released in that is what what happens when we are people of his presence because we're fitly framed together. We're joined. There's an army that God forms. And that's what I see happening as we grow. God is forming an army. And some of the army are wounded warriors. And we need to be ready to love them and pour oil and wine and, and bandage their wounds. And so I, I, I really have the sense, the other thing that, that comes to mind is that we, we should learn to not be presumptuous about what God wants to do in a moment or in the future. Like, Lord, we come almost like with this clean slate. We're expectant for you to do what you always do. You kiss our gatherings with his presence, which I just have to say, I just want to take a moment and say, thank you, God. Because there's no other place I'd rather be. And we need your presence. We are your people, your sons and daughters. And the church needs your presence. We want to be sensitive to your presence. Holy Spirit, teach us not to grieve or quench you, but to yield our hearts. We want to follow the Lamb, the heart beat of heaven. So we surrender, we yield our hearts. We're willing to yield. The wisdom of heaven is willing to yield. And so thank you, God, that you are fitly framing us together. You're baptizing us in your presence. I'm reminded of Ezekiel 47 about the river. That's a picture of the river in Genesis and the river in the book of Revelation that flows from the temple. We are the temple corporately, not just individually, but corporately. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 47, this vision, the prophet sees the river go out and then it's ankle deep and then he goes out and he's knee deep and then waist deep. And then it says that it was too deep where you had to swim and it was a river that could not be crossed. And the Bible goes on to say in Ezekiel 47 that everything that touched the river was healed. And then the trees that were planted by the river bore fruit 12 months out of the year. That is what God intends to do with his church. Not just this church, but the wor- around the world that we would be that river. And here's the thing, the temple, we're the temple, we gather it's not just the, the, it's not the building, right? It's a spiritual house. But how many know the building is actually angels hang out there? It's the place that we worship. It's sacred space. Yeah. There are sacred spaces in the realm of the spirit. Have you ever walked in a room and it felt sacred? Yeah. You ever walked in a room and it didn't feel sacred? Yeah. It's, it's just like it is in the natural. There's no separation with the spiritual and the natural. They're intertwined. But may we become those people that are like we cut and and. The river flows from the temple. And guess what? Check this out. It gets deeper the further out it goes. So when we do an outreach in July in the park, which you don't know about yet because we haven't announced it, but I'm telling you now. Imagine how deep the waters are going to be out there when we're preaching the gospel. Imagine the blind eyes opening, the deaf ears hearing, come on, the lame walking. Dan, who are you going to lay hands on and watch them be whole? You're going to watch tumors fall off of people. The water gets deeper the further we go. See, being a people of presence are a people that say yes to the apostolic call, which is to be sent ones. God, the Father sending us to represent him in the earth. And that our hearts are willing to go. That we're like, I'm taking personal responsibility for the Great Commission. I'm going. You're being released in your destiny. And and that's what worship leads us to. The purest form of worship or evangelism is worship. That's right. That's right. Because when you encounter him, you can't you you cannot help but to tell everybody. One encounter with God. And then everywhere you go, I was in Wegmans the other day and I wanted to make this Mediterranean meal. I don't know why. It was the Lord. I was thinking about Jesus. I'm like, Jesus probably ate some of these ingredients. 
hummus. And I'm like, just, you know, I, I like to cook. So I'm like, I need some fresh parsley. It was like I could taste the parsley before it hit my mouth. And I'm like, I'm going to make this wonderful dinner for my wife. And then she texts me that she's not hungry. And I literally wanted to throw it all in the garbage. I was so annoyed. But listen, I go to Wegmans craving parsley. And I walk up and there's this lady, Pastor Zach. I haven't seen her in, a, in months and months. And she's like, begins to share her heart. She's going through a valley. God brought me to the parsley. I, I never get parsley. The Lord did that. And, and I grabbed her hand, began to pray for her. She starts weeping. I'm like, the river was flowing right there. That's what happens when we're released as people of presence. We bring the river everywhere we go. And it should get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper as it flows out from the temple. But God is forged, forming an army. And it's not easy being fitly framed together. It's actually painful. I want to resound. I'll be very brief. But I'll resound. This last three years and ten months have been extremely difficult but extremely rewarding. And we're coming into a place of promise where, and harvest where, and I, I just have to say, you're worth it. And the harvest is worth it. But more than anything, his presence is worth it. His presence is worth it. May we burn with a fresh passion for the presence of God. <sighs> Better is one day. Like, I'd rather be a door keeper. I don't have to be up here, man. I'd rather, I just want to be in the room where God manifests his love and power and glory. Father, brand our hearts. Something happens, man, on this journey. I got saved when I was 17 and I've encountered the Lord and it's like the more living water you drink, it's like you can't get enough. There's a dissatisfied satisfaction. We're like, I'm satisfied, but I keep wanting more. I have to go back to this fountain, the source of all life. Where else can I go? He alone has the words of life. And that's what it means to be people of the presence. And we carry that with us wherever we go. It's that life. It's the gospel. And so I think that's where we're headed. We're headed to a place where we become love to the world around. We become living water to the world around us. Like the woman at the well, he says, it will be a well in you springing up into everlasting life. Then she goes and tells her story to her city and the whole city believes in Jesus. One testimony, meeting a man that knew everything about her and told her about living water. Yeah, but something happens when we get hungry. And it, I'll say this, when you come to a gathering Wednesday night or a little Bible study, come with a stirring heart. I don't know what you're going to do, Lord, but I know it's going to be good. Sometimes you have a sense of it in the spirit, but I, I feel like we miss it. Can I just say something to you prophetically? I feel like sometimes there's a culture of presumption where we have this thing in our mind, well, I know what the Lord's going to do. And then it's like, you might have a sense of it. Like we prophesy in part, but sometimes it's healthier to come just to want to encounter him versus want to come to bring something to the table. Does that make sense? Like I'm not coming because I want to prophesy over someone. That's wonderful. You want to bring life to somebody in a gathering, but may we come with like this burning heart where we just begin to burn and worship. I would even encourage you before service starts, before worship starts, just sit in your chair and just pray. Come to the altar. I'm praying that God breaks the limitations and the presumption and the pride that keeps us from coming up to this altar in freedom and worship, man. That there would be a hunger, a holy discontent that's like, God, I'm hungry for more. I'm satisfied, but there's more that you want to do in this region. There has been a fossilized, like stagnant spirit that has crippled the body of Christ in this region. And it's time to get hungry again. And the only way you can get hungry is if you begin to feast and you begin to drink. Sometimes the reason you're not thirsty is because you don't drink enough water. But when you drink more water, you get more thirsty. So any opportunity you have to drink water, drink water. 
and, and pray and, and, and let your heart burn and worship and sing. And when the pastor, even though it annoys you, lift your hands again for the 18th time. Lift your hands because it's an obedience. There's something about our hearts yielded and postured and surrender. We're saying, God, we want more. God, we want more. God, we want more. There's more for us. We look back at the revivals of times past, the Azusa Street Revival, where a blind preacher named William Seymour said there's got to be more than this. And his desire and hunger for the baptism of power and the Holy Spirit ushered in a move of God, ushered in a move of God that broke down walls, that broke down ethnic barriers, and that changed the face even to this day that the West Coast does not have the same racial barriers that are on the East Coast because a man was hungry for the heart of God. You think about Evan Roberts, the Welsh revivalist that heard a prayer that said, bend me, Lord, bend me. And 100,000 people get saved in a 12-month period known as the Welsh Revival. It's hunger. It's longing. God, I'm not satisfied. I, I, I probably irritate the people around me because I'm like, I want more. Worship is great, but I want more. Like I, Until I see everyone face down on the ground, then maybe I'll be satisfied. And it's not just the response. It's not just the outward. I'm just saying, God, may we unlearn this presumptuous attitude that we have just just shake it off and come and say lord what is it just sit at the feet of jesus what is it you want to do i don't want to be martha so busy not even aware of who's in the room i want to sit at the feet of jesus like mary and i'm willing to break it all open at his feet i don't care how much it costs it's he is worth it his presence is worth it Can we stand up together and just worship the Lord right now? Come on, thank Him for His presence. You feel stirring in your heart. Lift up your prayer language right now and begin to cry out to the Lord. Thank you, Father. Come on, give it a shout. Give it a roar. Oh, we want you, Jesus. We want you, Jesus. We want a move of heaven in our midst, God. We say yes to you. We say yes to you. We don't want to hold back what you have, God. I hold nothing back because you're worthy. I hold nothing back because you're worth it. I hold nothing back because my city is hungry. Because the people are crying out for a move of God. And I will become a move of God. I will become what you want me to become, Jesus. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. Wake up, church. I speak to the body of Christ in this region. And I call forth awakening right now. Come on, say it with me. Wake up, church. Wake up. Wake up, bride of Christ. Hey, Alaba. Shake us, Lord. Stir us, Lord. Bend us, God. Hey, Alaba. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey, Amama Te Adele Sebene Batoye. Mambre Vete. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. If you want fresh fire, run to this altar right now. Come on. Come and burn. Come and burn. Come and burn. Just burn. Cry out in your prayer language. Let the winds blow, Lord. That's it. Just keep praying in the Holy Spirit. Cry out. Chris O'Reilly, would you come up here if you can? Before Pastor Zach uh, invited everybody to come and, and pray at the altar, I looked over to my right and there was like a six or eight young people had come up to the altar without even being asked. And you know what? You know what's going to shake this generation, church? You know what's going to change the course of this generation? Is a people of God that are on fire that said, I will burn for the Lord and I will burn for Him. And I don't care what the world calls it. I'm going to burn for Jesus because he's worthy, because he's worth it. He's worthy. He's worth it, church. This generation is crying out for something real. We are to be the real thing. 
So we choose to burn for you, Jesus. I don't want reputation. I want Jesus. Him and Him alone. Stretch your hands high. Just lift your hands to heaven right now. Jesus. Lord, touch your people, I pray. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe refreshing upon your people now. And the fire of the Holy Spirit, the same fire in the upper room would rest upon us now in the name of Jesus. Put your hand over your heart and just say, brand my heart, Lord. Brand my heart, Lord. I'll never be the same. Brand our hearts, Lord. Brand our hearts, Lord. Brand our hearts this morning. Whoa. Holy. The water line is rising. Can you feel it? Can you feel it when you're out there? Can you feel it when you're in Wegmans? Have you ever been to Sea Breeze? There's that big bucket. My husband was telling me this. It fills up with water, fills up with water, fills up with water. It starts to tilt, and anything anywhere near it gets drenched. In the supernatural realm, that's what's happening now. You're sensing a change in the atmosphere. Yesterday, I was having a really down day. My husband asked me to go to Subway to pick up some submarine sandwiches. I walk in. I'm standing in line. It's, it's, you know, nothing special is happening. And I look to the person next to me and I say, God bless you. I see the kindness of God on you. You take a risk when you do that, but you also give them permission to respond. And she looks at me, really? You see that? I just came from my church. She's over on Seneca Parkway. I just came from my church. You see that on me? Another time I'm walking out of the place and I, I say, God bless you to another person. She looks at me. She says, happy Mother's Day. I won't get to see you again. So happy Mother's Day. As I was leaving, God said, turn around and go back. I turned around and went back and I said, when you said that to me, I felt the presence of God come on both of us in this place. I said, we'd be having church right now, right here. I walked out. She yelled across the parking lot to me, I can see light all over you. Keep doing what you're doing. Okay, this was a bad day. I wasn't feeling good, right? So then I drive through Starbucks, and I give the guy a $1 tip. This kid leans out the window and says, you don't know what this means. You don't know what goes on inside this place. My manager wants me to quit, but he won't tell me to. He's just making life miserable for me. And I looked at him and I said, God is going to use what's happening with you right now. He's going to connect the dots in your life because he has hope and a future for you. And I, and I left. I drove out. So you be ready. So we come against that thing which makes us self-conscious. Well, I could never do that. That's a lie out of hell. You carry the very presence of God with you, so we release that over each and every one of you today. We already did business in the Spirit, so walk out and act like it. This is an exhortation. Now is the time. Now is why you're here. This is what we've waited for. Don't let the enemy say someday, someday, someday. Someday is here. So we step into what we're doing now. This is just a first fruit. The water is going to dump. Can you say amen to that? Lately, God has just been putting a lot of uh, young men in my life. And God's just been stirring our heart. And for all the young people in here, God doesn't want us to hide away no more. God wants us to be bold. God wants us to be bold in this city. There are people we have to save and we have to be devout. We have to stay grounded in our faith and be bold about this because we have the truth. We have the truth and we have the person who can set people free. And this, and this group yesterday when we were talking, my friend said, nobody's coming for this city. 
Nobody's coming. So many times I tried to leave Rochester and God brought me right back. This is where you're called, Abdullah. This is where we're called. All of us right here. We have to go and save our city and be bold about it and be used everywhere. Be used in our workplace. Be used in the sports. Be used everywhere. We have to stand in boldness, young people. Nobody's coming for this city. And we have to be mighty. We have to be mighty. Jesus brought me from so much. I never would have thought I would have been here. And I'm coming back for everybody. I don't want to see nobody dead no more. I don't want to see no more girls hurt or young men lost because of that fatherless wound. I didn't grow up with my dad. And God healed me. And now we have the power to do that for everybody in the city. And we have to be bold. We have to be bold. Nobody's coming for this city. God sent us. It's us. We are the hands and feet. Enough of being embarrassed. I will go and talk about Jesus all day. All day. And we all have to do it. We all have to do it. Young people, we got to stand up. We got to stand up and we got to have a heart for this. Jesus looked at the people and he had compassion for them. He had compassion and we got to have compassion for people out here and we need to go out. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility and the harvest is here. It is here and we are called to go. I'm standing up. I'm standing up. Thank you, Jesus.